The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, today we are going to learn to count one, two, three, <laughs> uh, in an algorithmic sense, of course, and prove hardness of counting style problems, or more generally, any problem where the output is an integer. Um, like, uh, like approximation algorithms, we need to define a slightly stronger version of our NP style problem. It's not going to be a deci decision problem. The remaining type is a search problem. Uh, search problem, you're trying to find a solution. This is just like optimization problem, but with no objective function. Today, all solutions are created equal. So we just want to know how many there are. So we're given an instance of the problem. We want to produce a solution. Whereas in the decision problem, we want to know whether a solution exists. With a search problem, we want to find a solution. Almost the same thing, but. So that would be a search problem in general. Uh, for an NP search problem, you can recognize what is an instance, and you can recognize solutions to instances in polynomial time. Given an instance and a solution, you can say, yes, that's a valid solution. OK, uh, for such a search problem, of course, there's the corresponding decision problem, which is, does there exist a solution? Uh, if you can solve this, then you can solve uh, that. Uh, you can solve the decision problem in NP. Uh, by guessing a solution, uh, and so on. So this is intricately related to uh, the notion of a certificate for an NP problem. The idea is solutions are certificates. But when we say a problem is an NP, we say there is some way to define certificates so that this kind of problem can be set up. Uh, and the goal here, the point here is to solidify a specific notion of certificate. You can't just use any one, because we're going to count them. That if you formulate the certificates in different ways, you'll get different counts. But in general, uh, every NP problem can be converted into an NP search problem in at least one way. But each notion of certificate gives you a notion of a search problem. OK, uh, in some complexity context, these are called NP relations, the way you specify what a certificate is. But I think this is the more algorithmic perspective. All right, so given such a search problem, we turn it into a counting problem. So let's say a search problem is called A, then counting problem will be sharp A, not hashtag A. <laughs> uh, some people call it number A. And the problem is count the number of solutions for a given instance. OK, so in particular, you detect whether the number is 0 or not 0. So this is strictly harder in some sense than the decision problem, does there exist a solution? And we will see some problems where the search problem is polynomial, but the corresponding counting problem is actually hard. Uh, I can't say NP hard, there's going to be a new notion of hardness. Uh, so some examples. Pretty much every problem we've defined as a decision problem had a search problem in mind. Um, so something like sat, you, you need to satisfy all of the things. So there's no objective function here, but you want to know how many different ways, how many different variable assignments are there that satisfy the given formula. Or you take your favorite pencil and paper puzzle. 
we'll be looking at uh, Shaka Shaka today, again. Um, how many different solutions are there? You'd like, when you're designing a puzzle, usually you want to know that it's unique. So it'd be nice if you could count the number of solutions and show that it's one. Um, these problems are going to turn out to be very hard, of course. So let's define a notion of hardness. Sharp P is going to be the class of all of these counting problems. Uh, this is the sort of certificate. Yeah, question? Um, just for the puzzle application, is it going to turn out that counting if there's one solution versus more than one solution is like as hard as just counting so hard? Uh, it's not quite as hard, but uh, w we will show that distinguishing one from more than one is very hard. It's NP-complete, actually. That's a decision problem. We can show that that's NP-complete. Uh, so normally we think of zero versus one, but it turns out one versus two is not, or one versus more than one is uh, about the same difficulty. Counting is even harder, I would say. Uh, but it's bad news all around. <laughs> Just different notions of bad. Um, Cool. So this is the sort of certificate perspective. M with MP, we had I had give you two different definitions: certifi certificate perspective and a non-deterministic computation perspective. You can do the same computational perspective here. Uh, you could say sharp P is the set of uh, problems solved by uh, polynomial time. Call it a non-deterministic counting algorithm. We don't need Turing machines for this definition, although that was, of course, the original definition. Uh, so take your favorite non-deterministic algorithm, as usual for NP. It makes guesses at various points, multiple branches. With the NP algorithm, the, the way we would execute it on an NP-style machine is that uh, we would see whether there's any path that led to a yes. Again, this can output yes or no at the end. In this case, what the computer does, the sharp P-style computer, is it, you conceptually, it runs all the branches. It counts the number of yeses and returns that number. So even though the algorithm is designed to return yes or no, the, when, you, when it executes, it actually outputs a number. <laughs> In the original paper, it says magically. <laughs> uh, it's just as magic as an NP machine, but a little, even a little more magical. Um, OK, so you, I mean, if you're not, not comfortable with that, we just use this definition. Same thing. Uh, this is all work done by uh, Les Valiant in the s late 70s, these notions. Okay, so it's pretty clear, it's pretty easy to show all these problems are in sharp P because they were the corresponding decision problems were in NP. We can convert them into uh, sharp P algorithms. Um, now let's think about hardness with respect to sharp P. Uh, as usual, we want it to mean as hard as all problems in that class, meaning that we can reduce all those problems to our problem. Uh, and the question is via what kind of reductions? And here we're going to allow very powerful reductions. We've talked about these reductions, but never actually been allowed to use them. Multi-call Cook-style reductions. Um, I think in general, this is a common approach for FNP, uh, which is uh, functions, NP-style functions, which you can also think of this as kind of a, f uh, the counting version is the output is a value. So you have a function instead of just a decision question. Um, when the output is some thing, some number in this case, uh, you might have to manipulate that number at the end. And so at the very least, you need to make a call and then do some stuff before you return your modified answer in your reduction. Uh, but in fact, we're going to allow full tilt. You can make multiple calls to some hypothetical solution to uh, your problem in order to solve all problems in sharp P. And we'll actually use multi-call a bunch of times. We won't always need multi-call. Uh, often we'll be able to get away with a much simpler kind of reduction. Let me tell you that kind now. 
but in general, we allow arbitrary multi-call. Yeah? You're, you're, uh, you're not limited in the number of multi-calls. Right. You can do polynomial number of multi-calls. As before, reduction should be polynomial time. Uh, but uh, So you're, you're basically given an algorithm, it's usually called an oracle, that solves your problem uh, solves your problem B, and you want to solve, yeah, and you want to solve A by multiple calls to B. So we'll, we'll see a bunch of examples of that. Uh, here's a more familiar style of reduction. And often, for a lot of problems, we can get away with this, but especially a lot of the early proofs needed the multi-call. And as you'll see, you can do lots of cool tricks with multi-call uh, using number theory. Uh, so parsimonious reduction, um, this is for NP search problems. This is going to be a lot like an NP reduction, the regular style. So again, we convert an instance x of a via function f into an instance x prime of b. Uh, and that function should be computable in poly time. So far, just like an NP reduction. And usually we would say, for, an, for a search problem, we would say there exists a solution for x if and only if there exists a solution for x prime. That would be a, the analo direct analog of an NP uh, style reduction. But we're going to ask for a stronger condition, which is that the number of solutions uh, to problem A uh, to instance x equals the number of solutions of type B to instance x prime. Okay, so in particular, if this one's greater than or equal to 1, this one would be greater than or equal to 1, and vice versa. So this is stronger than an NP style reduction for the corresponding decision problem. Okay, um, yeah, so I even read that down. This implies that the decision problems have same answer. So in particular, this implies that we have an NP reduction. So, uh, in particular, if A, the decision version of A is NP-hard, then the decision version of B is NP-hard. But more interesting is that if A is sharp P-hard, then B is sharp P-hard. So, but also, this holds for NP. For the decision versions of A and B, uh, sorry sharp A and sharp B. Okay, this is a subtle distinction. Uh, for sharp B hardness, we're talking about the counting problems and we're talking about making calls to other counting solutions and then doing things with those numbers and who knows what, making many calls. Uh, with parsimonious reduction, we're thinking about the, the non-counting version, just the search problem. And uh, so, we're not worried about counting solutions directly. I mean, it, what's nice about parsimonious reductions is they look just like NP reductions for their regular old problems. We just need this extra pro property, parsimony, that uh, the number of solutions to the is preserved through the transformation. And a lot of the proofs that we've covered <coughs> follow, uh, follow, have this property and will be good for us. Once we, if we can get our source problems hard, then we'll get a lot of target problems hard as well. Uh, cool, let me um, tell you about one more version which I made up, simonious uh, reductions. Uh, this is my attempt at understanding the etymology of parsimonious, uh, which is something like something like little money, uh, being very thrifty. Uh, so this is having a little bit more money. You have C dollars, <laughs> uh, but you have to be very consistent about it. I should probably add some 
word that means uniform in the middle there. But I want the number of solutions of x prime to equal c times the number of solutions uh, to x. Uh, c is a fixed constant. Okay, and it has to be the same for every x. This would be just as good from a sharp p perspective because uh, if I could solve b and I wanted to solve a, I would convert a to b, run the thing, then divide by c. There will never be a remainder, and then I have my answer to a. Okay, as long as c is not zero, <laughs> c should be an integer here. We will see a bunch of c monious um, reductions. I guess. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be totally independent of x. Uh, it can depend on things like n, something that we can compute easily, I guess. It shouldn't be too dependent on x. All right, um, let's, do, let's look at some examples. Uh, so I'm going to make a list here of uh, sharp p complete problems. And we'll start with versions of SAT because we like SAT. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you that sharp um, 3 SAT is hard. First, sharp SAT is hard, and the usual proof of SAT hardness uh, shows sharp P completeness for sharp SAT. Um, and with, if you're careful about the conversion from SAT to 3CNF, you can get sharp 3 SAT is hard. It's not terribly interesting and tedious, so I will uh, skip that one. Uh, so, what about planar 3SAT? Um, I've stared at this diagram many times for a while. Uh, this is lecture 7 uh, for replacing a crossing and a 3SAT thing with this picture. And all of this argument, and this table in particular, was concluding that uh, the variables are forced in this scenario. If you know what A and B are, uh, so when, once you choose what A and B are, these two have to be copies of A and B, and then it ended up that A w we proved that A1 equaled A2 and B1 equaled B2, and then these variables were all determined by these formula. And so once you know A and B, all the variable settings are forced, which means you preserve the number of solutions. So planar sharp 3 sat is sharp B complete. I'd like to pretend that there's some debate within the sharp P community about whether the sharp should go here or here. Uh, I, I kind of prefer it here, but uh, I've seen it over here, so, you know. Uh, all right, I've, I don't think I've even seen that mentioned, but I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Uh, so, you know, let's flip through our other planar uh, hardness proofs. Uh, this is planar, monotone, rectilinear, 3SAT, mainly the monotone aspect. We wanted to, there to be all the variables to be positive or negative in every clause. And so we had this trick for forcing this thing to be not equal to this thing, basically copying the variable with a flip uh, in its truth. But again, everything here is forced. The, the variables we make are guaranteed to be copies or negations of other variables. So we preserve number of solutions. So this is hard too. What else? Uh, I think we can, uh, I've just made this up, but we can add the dash 3 as usual by replacing each variable with a little cycle. Uh, what about planar 1 and 3 sat? So we had, uh, we actually had two ways to prove this. This is one of the reductions. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we checked that this set of sat clauses. These are the sat clauses implemented this one and three sat clause. And I stared at this for a while. and It's kind of hard to tell. So I just wrote a program to enumerate all cases and found there's exactly one case where this is not parsimonious. Uh, and that's when this is false and these two are true. Um, and because of these negations, you can either solve the internal things like this or you can flip all of the internal nodes and that will also be satisfied. Now, this is bad news because all the other cases, there is a unique solution over here. 
Uh, but in this case, there are exactly two solutions. If it was two everywhere, we'd be happy. That would be two monious. Uh, if it was one everywhere, we'd be happy. Happy that would be parsimonious. But because it's a mixture of one and two, you know, we approximately preserve the counts within a factor of two. But that's not good enough for sharp p. We need exact preservation. So this is no good. Uh, luckily, we had another proof, which was actually a stronger result, planar, positive, rectilinear, one and three sat. Uh, this was a version with no negation. And this one does work. Uh, there, was, there was, first of all, this, uh, the not equal gadget and the equal gadget. I don't want to go through them, but again, uh, A was forced to be zero, C was forced to be one, which forces B and D to be zero in this picture. So uh, all is good. Again, parsimonious there. And then this, this one was too complicated to think about, so I again wrote a program to check, try all the cases, and every, every choice of XYZ over here that's satisfied, this is a reduction from three sets. So if at least one of these is true, there will be exactly one solution over here. And just as before, uh, if, there, if zero of them are true, then there'll be no solution here. That, that we already knew. Uh, so good news. Uh, I should check whether that's mentioned in their paper, but it proves planar, positive, rectilinear, one and three sat is sharp P complete. Sharp go here, here. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this lots of fun results. Uh, we get a lot of results just from Im by looking at old proofs. Now they're not all going to work, uh, but I have one more example that does work. Um, shaka shaka, remember the puzzle? Uh, so Nikoli puzzle, you uh, every square, every white square can be filled in with a black thing, uh, but adjacent to a two, there should be exactly two of those. Uh, and you want all of the resulting white regions to be rectangles, possibly rotated. And we had this reduction from planar three set. Uh, and there's basically this, this type of wire. And there's exactly two ways to solve a wire. One for true, one for false. So once you know what the variable is, you're forced to what to do. There was uh, also a parity shifting gadget and splits and turns. But again, exactly two ways to solve everything. Uh, so parsimonious. And then the clause, everything was basically forced. Just you're forced whether to have these uh, square diamonds, and you just eliminated the one case where the clause is not satisfied. So there's really no flexibility here, one way to solve it, and so it's a parsimonious reduction. And indeed, in the paper we mentioned, this implies Sharpie completeness of counting Shaka Shaka solutions. Cool. Uh, here's an example that doesn't work. A little different. Uh, Hamiltonicity, or I guess I want to count the number of Hamiltonian cycles. It's the natural uh, counting version of Hamiltonicity. Uh, so we had two proofs for this. Neither of them work in, in uh, sharp P sense. Uh, this one, remember the idea was that you would traverse back and forth one way or the other to get all of these nodes. That was a variable. That's fine. There's exactly two ways to do that. Uh, but then the clause, the clause had to be satisfied by at least one of the three variables. And if it's satisfied, for example, by all three variables, then it could be this node is picked up like this, or the node could be picked up this way, or the node could be picked up this way. So there are three different solutions, even for one fixed variable assignment. So that's bad. We're not allowed to do that. Uh, it'd be fine if everyone was three, but some will be one, some will be two, some will be three. That's going to be some weird product of those over the clauses. Uh, so that doesn't work. We had this other proof. Um, uh, the, this was a notation for this gadget, which forced either this directed edge or this directed edge to be in, uh, used, but not both. It's an XOR. So that's, remember, what these things meant. And that we had the variable true or false, and then we connected them to the clauses. Then separately, we had a crossover. Uh, but the trouble is in the clauses, uh, because, th again, the idea was that the variable chose this guy this one was forbidden. That's actually the good case, I think. Uh, if the variable chose this, um, chose this one, then this one must be included. That's bad news. Uh, if, you, oh, if you follow this, and then this, and then this, then you cut off this part of the graph, and you don't get one Hamiltonian cycle. You want at least one variable 
to uh, allow you to go left here, and then you can go and grab all this stuff and come back. But again, if multiple variables satisfy this thing, any one of them could grab this, the left rectangle. And so you get multiple solutions, not parsimonious. But parts of this proof are useful, and they were used to make a parsimonious proof. Uh, so the part that was useful is this XOR gadget and the way to implement crossovers. So um, just remember that you can build XORs <laughs> and that you can cross them over using a bunch of XORs. So only XOR connections, these notations, can be crossed in this view. Uh, we're going to build more gadgets, and this is uh, proof by Sato in 2002. It was a bachelor's thesis, actually, in Japan. And so here you see redrawn the XOR gadget. Here it's going to be for undirected graphs. Same, same structure works. Uh, and this is to do the crossover using XOR. So he's denoting XORs with this big X connected to two things. Okay. Now, given that, we can build an OR gadget, which says that either we use this edge or we use this edge or both. Uh, okay, here we're not using an XOR, but... Uh, this is the graph, and the key is this, this has to be done uniquely. That's in particular the point of these dots. This looks asymmetric, it's kind of weird, uh, but let's see. For example, if they're both in, then this guy can do this, and this guy can do that. But it's not symmetric. You couldn't flip. This guy can't grab these points. Uh, that would be a second solution, which would be bad, but we miss these points. So this guy has to stay down here. Uh, if he's in at all, and then this guy is the only one who can grab those extra points. Um, or if just the top guy is in, then you do this, okay? And if just the bottom guy is in, uh, I think it's a symmetric. That is symmetric, okay? And it's unique. Good. Uh, there's an implication, so this says, if this edge is in, then that edge must be in the Hamiltonian cycle. Uh, and this is essentially by copying. And we just have to grab an extra edge and add this little <laughs> extra thing just for copying value. So uh, if this one is in, then this edge must not be used, which means this edge, if it's used, must go straight. But in particular, this is not used. And we have an OR. That means that this one must be forced by a property of OR. On the other hand, uh, if this is not set, this one must be used. So I guess this must be an edge that was uh, already going to be used for something. Uh, so that edge is just going to get diverted down here. Uh, and then the OR was doesn't constrain this at all, because 0 or 1, this one is 1, so the OR is happy. So that's an implication. Uh, it's going to be a little more subtle <laughs> how we combine these. Um, this is the, This is the tricky gadget. I sort of understand it, but uh, there's a lot of details to check, especially on the uniqueness front. Uh, but this is a three-way OR, which we're using for s clause, SAC clause, of course, three SAC clause. We want it, uh, at least one of these three edges to be in the Hamiltonian cycle, and so here we use XORs, ORs, implications, and more XORs. Uh, I'll show you the intended solution, assuming I can remember it. Uh, <laughs> So let's say, for example, this, this edge is in the Hamiltonian cycle. Then uh, we're going to do something like go over here, uh, come back around like this, and then... I think you just violated the uh, XOR already. This XOR? Yeah. Uh, no, I went here. Yeah, and then you went up. Oh, then I went up. Good. So actually, I have to do this. And around, yeah. So these, all these constraints are thrown in basically to force it to be unique. Without them, you could still it would still work, but it wouldn't be parsimonious. Okay, let's see. Uh, this this doesn't constrain me. This this one. Good. And go up there. So I ex did exactly one of those, uh, and then I need to grab these. Okay, so that's one picture. I think it's. It's not totally symmetric. <laughs> Again, so you have to check all three of them. And you have to check, for example, uh, it's not so hard. Like if this guy was also in, I could have just gone here and this guy would pick up those nodes. Uh, so as long as, and in general, as long as at least one of them is on, you're OK. Uh, and furthermore, if they're all on, there's still a unique way to solve it, 
and I'm not going to go through that, but it's thanks to all of these constraints, they're cutting out multiple solutions. Okay, so uh, now we just have to put these together. This is pretty easy. Uh, it's pretty much like the old proof. Again, we have we represent variables by having uh, these double edges. So you in a Hamiltonian cycle, you're going to choose uh, one or the other. And then we have this exclusive or forcing y and y bar to choose opposite choices. And then there are these exclusive ors to say if you chose that one, then you can't choose it for this clause. And then the clauses are just represented by those three-way ors. So this overall structure is the same. The crossovers are done as before. And it's really these gadgets that have changed. And they're complicated, but it's parsimonious. So with a little more work, uh, we get that the number of Hamiltonian cycles in planar max degree 3 graphs is sharp P complete. So So that's nice. Um, and from that, we get Slitherlink. So this is, uh, I've sort of been hiding these facts from you when we originally covered these proofs. These, these papers actually talk about, uh, this one doesn't quite talk about sharp P, but it is also sharp P complete. Counting the number of solutions to Slitherlink is, is sharp P complete. This was the puzzle again. You have to have that number of adjacent edges, each number. And this, the proof was a reduction from planar max degree 3 Hamiltonian cycle. Um, and at the time, I said, oh, well, you could just assume it's a grid graph. And then you just need the required gadget, which is the B part. Just need this gadget. This was a gadget. Because it had these ones, it meant it had to be traversed, like a regular vertex in Hamiltonian cycle. And it turns out there was a way to traverse it straight or with turns. And then we could block off edges wherever there wasn't supposed to be an edge. And so if you're reducing from Hamiltonian grid graphs, that was the whole proof. And we were happy. Uh, now we don't know whether Hamiltonicity in grid graphs is sharp P complete. Um, we, to prove that, we would need to be able to put bipartite in here. And I don't know of a proof of that. It's a good open problem. So this was the reason that they had this other gadget, which was to make uh, a Hamiltonian uh, to make these white vertices that don't have to be traversed. They're just implementing an edge, basically. So just the black vertices have to be traversed. We needed that for drawing things on the grid. Uh, but if you just don't put in the ones and add in these zeros, uh, again, you can traverse it or not at all. Uh, and this one, as you can read here, says uh, this would be bad to have happen. And in fact, you can rule it out. It will never happen in the situations we want because the white vertices only have two neighbors that are uh, traversable. Uh, cool. And then, furthermore, all of these solutions are unique. <laughs> there is exactly one way to go straight. There's exactly one way to turn right, exactly one way to turn left. That's the subtle thing that was not revealed before. But if you stare at it long enough, you will be convinced. OK, so uh, this is a parsimonious reduction from planar max degree 3 Hamiltonian cycle to Slitherlink. So counting solutions in Slitherlink is hard. That was the fully worked out example. Any questions? Yeah. So are there examples of problems in P whose counting versions are sharply complete? Yes. And that will be the next topic. <laughs> uh, well, it's going to be a little while till we get there. But I'm going to prove things, and then we will get to an answer. But the answer is yes. Um, so question. Yeah. So, for if we wanted, to, if we're like thinking about a problem that we're trying to prove is MP hard, and we start thinking maybe it's not, we would just you know show it's MP by finding an algorithm. Is there a nice way to show that a problem is not in not sharp P hard? Uh, well, you usually you would say that sharp that problem is in P. You would find a polynomial counting algorithm, and there are, uh, there are lots of examples of polynomial counting algorithms, uh, especially on like trees. Typical thing is you dynamic program. So like maybe you want to know, let's say you have a rooted binary tree, and for each node you could flip it this way or not. How many different ways are there to do that? Uh, and maybe you have some constraints on how that's done. Uh, then you just try it flipped and try it not. You do dynamic programming, and then you 
um, multiply the two solution sizes together and you get the overall solution size. So you basically do combinatorics and uh, if there's independent choices you multiply, if there are uh, opposing choices you add, that kind of thing. And from that you get polynomial time counting algorithms. And in tree-like things that often works. <laughs> And about a tree width. Do we know of NP hard problems whose counting problems are not sharp here? So I guess that uh, technique would work. I would say generally most problems that are hard to decide are hard to count. And where NP hard implies sharp P hard. Uh, I don't think there's a hard theorem in that. There's there's nothing that really says the meta theorem that says that, but that's the feeling. Yeah. Be nice, then we wouldn't have to do all the parsimonious work, but All right, so uh, it's time for a little bit of uh, linear algebra. Let me remind you, I guess linear algebra is not a prereq for this class, but probably you've seen the determinant of a matrix and you use if it's zero, then it's not invertible, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let me remind you of a definition. And we rarely use matrix notation, so let me remind you of the usual one. Uh, n by n square matrix. This is a polynomial time problem. It is, but I'm going to define it in an exponential way, but you probably know a polynomial time algorithm. This is not an algorithms class, so you don't need to know it. Uh, but it's based on Gaussian elimination, the usual one. Uh, so you look at all permutation matrices, all n by n permutation matrices, which you can think of as a permutation pi on the numbers 1 through n, and you look at i comma pi of n, so that's a that defines a permutation matrix. You take the product of the matrix values, if you superimpose the permutation matrix on, that, uh, on the given matrix A, you take that product, you possibly negate it if the sign of your permutation was negative, if it does an even number, an odd number of, uh, of transpositions, then that's, this will be negative, otherwise it'll be positive, and you add those up. So the, of course, an exponential number of permutations, you wouldn't want to do this as an algorithm, but turns out it can be done in uh, polynomial time. The reason for talking about this is by analogy, I want the notion of permanent, of an n by n matrix. The same thing, but with this removed. Permanent of A is the sum over all permutations pi of the product from i equals 1 to n of ai pi of i. Now, this may not look like a counting problem. It turns out it is a counting problem, sort of, a weighted counting problem. Uh, we will get back to counting problems in a moment. This is related to the number of perfect matchings in a graph. But uh, at this point, it's just an, it's a quantity we want to compute. This is a function of a matrix, and computing this function is sharp peak complete. Yeah. Don't you just mean sine dot minus one Thule sine of pi? Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. It depends. If you call the number of transpositions mod two, so then it's zero or one. Okay. You know what I mean. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, so the claim is permanent is sharp P complete. We're going to prove this. This was the original problem proved sharp P complete. Well, other than sharp three sat, I guess. Same paper. Um, great. Uh, so let me give you a little intuition of what the permanent is. Uh, we'd like a definition that it's not so algebraic. At least I would like one more graph theoretic. Be nice. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to convert A, our matrix, into a weighted graph. And uh, then let me go to the other board.
Okay, how do we convert into a weighted graph, weighted directed graph? Well, the weight from vertex i to vertex j is aij. It's kind of the obvious transformation. Uh, if it's zero, then there's not going to be an edge, although it doesn't matter. You could leave the edge in with weight zero. It will be the same because what we're interested in, and the claim is the permanent of the matrix equals uh, the sum say, of the product of edge weights over all cycle covers of the graph. Okay, this is really just the same thing, but a little bit easier to think about. So a cycle cover is kind of like a Hamiltonian cycle, but there can be multiple cycles. So at every vertex, you should enter and leave. And so you have sort of in degree one and out degree one. So you end up decomposing the graph into vertex disjoint cycles, which hit every uh, vertex. That's a cycle cover. Important note here, we do have loops in the graph. Uh, we can have loops if AII is not zero, then you have a loop. So the idea is to look at every, uh, every cycle cover and just take the product of the edge weights of that are edges in the cycles and then add that up over all cycle covers. So it's the same thing if you stare at it long enough because you're going from I, I mean this is basically the cycle decomposition of the permutation if you know permutation theory. Okay, so if you don't, don't worry. This is your definition of permanent. Um, so we're going to prove this problem is Sharpie complete. And we're going to prove it by a simonious reduction. from sharp three set. You said this was the original uh, thing introducing that? Yes. Did they not call it C? You made up the term C. Yeah. What did they call uh, it? I think they uh, just called it a reduction. Uh, in this sense, I think pretty sure they just called it reduction. And for them, and they said at the beginning, reduction means multi-call reduction. So they're thinking about that. But it turns out to be a simonious reduction. Uh, C will not be literally a constant, but it will be a function of the problem size. And this is the reduction. So uh, as usual, we have a clause gadget and a variable gadget. And then there's this shaded thing, which is this matrix, uh, which you can think of as a graph. But in this case, it'll be easier to just think of as a black box matrix. OK. Uh, all of the edges in these pictures have weight 1. And then these edges are special. And uh, here you have some loops in the center. No one else has a loop. So the high level idea is if you're thinking of a cycle cover um, in a vertex, because you've got, uh, sorry, in a variable, because you've got a vertex here and a vertex here, um, you have to cover them somehow. And the, idea, the intent is that you either cover this one this way or you cover this one that way. Those will be the true and the false. Uh, and then, OK, from the clause perspective, we, we need to understand. Uh, so then these things are connected. This thing would go here, and this thing would go here. And generally, connect variables to clauses in the obvious way. Um, and in general, for every occurrence of the positive form and the negative form, sorry, positive or negative form, uh, you'll have a, one of these blobs that connects to the class. So overall architecture should be clear. What does this gadget do? It has some, some nifty properties. Let me write them down. So this matrix is called x in the paper. So first of all, uh, permanent of x equals 0. I'm just going to state these. I mean, you could check them by doing the computation. So we're interested in cycle covers whose products uh, are not zero, otherwise they don't contribute to the sum, right? So I could also add in non-zero, meaning the product is non-zero. Okay, so if we had a cycle cover that just uh, where the cycle cover just locally solved this thing by traversing these four vertices all by themselves, then that cycle would have permanent zero, and then the permanent of the whole cycle cover is the product 
of those things, uh, and so the overall thing would be zero. So if you're looking at a non-zero cycle cover, you can't just leave these isolated. You have to visit them. You have to enter them and leave them. Okay. Now the question is, where could you enter and leave them? It's maybe not cl totally clear from the drawing, but the intent is that the first vertex, uh, in th which corresponds to row one and column one here, is the left side, and the column four, row four, is the right side. I claim that you have to enter at one of those and leave at the other. Why is that true? For a couple of reasons. One is that the permanent of x with row and column one removed is zero, and so is the permanent of x with row and column four removed. Okay. Uh, Vertex 1 and 4 out of, out of this uh, X matrix are the only places you could enter and leave. But it's possible you enter and then immediately leave. So you just touch the thing and leave. That would correspond to leaving behind a 3x3 three three submatrix, either by deleting this row and column or by deleting this row and column if you just visit this vertex and leave. Uh, those also have permanent 0, so if you're looking at a non-zero cycle cover, you can't do that. So together those mean that you enter at one of them and leave at the other. And furthermore, uh, if you look at uh, the permanent of x with rows and columns 1 and 4 removed, both removed, that's also 0. So the permanent of this uh, matrix is 0. Uh, and therefore, you can't just enter here, jump here, and leave which means, finally, you have to traverse all four vertices. You enter at one of them, traverse everything, and leave at the other. So basically, this is a forced edge. Uh, if you touch here, you have to then traverse and leave there in any cycle cover. So we're used to seeing forced edges in Hamiltonian cycle. This is sort of a stronger form of it. That's cool. Now, one catch. So if you do that, if you enter, let's say, a vertex 1, and leave it for text 4, you will end up, your contribution to the cycle will end up being the permanent of x minus row 1 and column 4, or symmetrically with 4 and 1. You'd like this to be 1, but it's 4. So there are four ways to traverse the forced edge. But because it's always 4, or 0, and then it doesn't contribute at all, it's always going to be 4, so this will be a nice uniform blow up in our number of solutions. C is not going to be 4, but it's going to be 4 to some power. Uh, it's going to be 4 to the power of the number of those gadgets. <laughs> so because you can predict that, I mean, in the reduction, you know exactly how many there are. It's not dependent on the solution. It's only dependent on how you built this thing. So at the end, we're going to divide by 4 to the power. It's, uh, I think five times the number of clauses. So uh, C is going to be four to the power of five times the number of clauses, because there are five of these gadgets per clause. So at the end, we'll just divide by that and be done. Well, you times? Because you got it you know, on the variable side, too? Uh, yes, ten times. Thank you. Eight. Two, two, eight. two of those don't actually connect to variables. Two of them do not connect to variables. Yep, yeah, eight. Eight times the number of classes. Cool. Uh, all right. So now it's just a matter of, now that you understand what this is, um, now you can sort of see how information is communicated. Because if the variable, say, chooses the true setting, it must visit these edges. And once it touches here, it has to leave here. And this is a edge going the wrong way. So uh, you can't try to traverse. From here, you cannot touch the, the clauses down below. You, once you touch here, you have to go here, and then you must leave here, and so on. Um, but you leave this one behind, and it must be traversed by the clause, and vice versa. If I choose this one, then these must be visited by the clauses. So from the clause perspective, as you said, there are five of these gadgets, but only three of them are connected. So these guys are forced. Uh, and there's a bunch of edges here, and it's a case analysis, so it would be the short version. Let's just do a couple of examples. 
if none of these have been traversed by the variable, uh, then the pretty much you have to go straight through, but then you're in trouble uh, because there's no pointer back to the beginning. You can only go back this far. Okay, so if, none of, if you have to traverse all these things, it's not possible with a cycle cover. Uh, but if any one of them has been traversed, so for example, if this one has been traversed, then we'll jump over it, visit these guys, jump back here, visit this guy, and jump back there. And if you check, that's the only way to do it. It's unique. Uh, and similarly, any one of them has been covered, or if all three of them have been covered, or if two of them have been covered, in all cases, there's a unique way uh, from the clause perspective to connect all the things. Now, in reality, there's four ways to traverse each of these things, so the whole thing grows by this product, but it doesn't matter which cycle they appear in, we'll always scale the number of solutions by factor four. So it's nice uniform scaling, simonious. And that's permanent. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool proof. Um, now, one not so nice thing about this proof is it involves numbers negative one, zero, one, two, and three. Uh, for reasons we will see in a moment, it would be really nice to just use zero and one. And it turns out that's possible. But it's kind of annoying. <laughs> uh, it's nifty, though. I think this will demonstrate a bunch of fun number theory things you can do. So next goal is zero, one permanent. When the matrix is just zeros and ones, uh, this is Sharpie complete. Um, I'll tell you the reason that is particularly interesting. As it gets rid of the weights, it makes it more clearly uh, makes it more clearly a counting problem. So first of all, it is the number of cycle covers in the corresponding graph. It's no more weights. It's just if it's a zero, there's not an edge, and so you can't traverse there. If it's a one, you can traverse there. And then every cycle cover will have product one. So it's just counting them. Uh, but it also happens to be the number of perfect matchings in a bipartite graph. Which bipartite graph? Uh, the bipartite graph where one side of the bipartition is the rows and the other side is the columns of the matrix. And you have an edge, ij, if and only if uh, a i, sorry, ij is not a good not the best terminology for i, where i here is a vertex of v1 and j is a vertex of v2. Uh, whenever ij equals 1, if it's 0, there's no edge. Um, I had, I was, this is a little confusing because uh, the matrix is not symmetric. So you might say, well, how does this make an undirected graph? Because you could have an edge from i to j, but not to j to i. That's OK, because i is interpreted in the left space and j is interpreted in the right space. So the asymmetric case would be the case that there's an edge from here to here, but not an edge from here to here. That's perfectly OK. This is 1, 2, 3. For a 3 by 3 matrix, we get a 6 vertex graph, not 3 vertex. Okay, that's what allows you to be asymmetric. Uh, and a, a loop, what we were normally thinking as a loop, just means a horizontal edge. OK, so it turns out, if you look at this graph, which is a different graph from what we started with, um, the number of perfect matchings in that graph is equal to the number of cycle covers in the other graph, in the directed graph. So this one's undirected and bipartite. This one was directed and not bipartite. And the rough intuition is that uh, we're just kind of pulling the vertices apart into two versions, the left version and the right version. If you imagine there being a connection from one right to one left, and similarly from two right to two left, directed, and three right to three left, hey, it looks like cycles again. You went here, uh, then you went around, then you went here, then you went there. That was a cycle. And similarly, this was a cycle. So they're the same thing. OK, this is cool because perfect matchings are interesting. In particular, perfect matchings are easy to find in polynomial time. But counting them is sharp P complete. Getting back to that question. So that's why we care about 0, 1, 
permanent or one reason to care about it. Let's prove that it's hard. And here we'll use some number theory. Pretty basic number theory. So first claim is that computing the permanent of a matrix, general matrix, not 0, 1, uh, modulo a given integer r is hard. Uh, r has to be an input for this problem. It's not like computing it mod 3 necessarily is hard, but computing it modulo anything is hard. And here we're going to finally use some multicolor reduction power. So the idea is, suppose you could solve this problem then I claim I can solve permanent. Anyone know how? Chinese remainder theorem. Chinese remainder theorem. Okay, if you don't know the Chinese remainder theorem, but you should know it. It's good. Um, so the idea is we're going to set R to be all primes up to um, how big? Well, we can stop when the product of all the primes that we've considered is uh, bigger than the potential permanent. And the permanent is at most uh, m to the n times n factorial, where m is the largest absolute value in the matrix. That's one upper bound. Doesn't really matter, but the point is that it's computable. And if you take the logarithm, it's not so big. Uh, all these numbers are at least two. All primes are at least two. <laughs> so uh, the number of primes we'll have to consider is at most log base two of that. Uh, so this means the number of primes must log of m to the n times n factorial, and this is roughly, I'll put a tilde here, this is like n log m, that's exact, plus n log n, that's approximate, but you know, it's minus, little, m minus order n, so won't hurt us. Uh, so that's good, that's polynomial. Log m is a reasonable thing, m was given us as a number, so log m is part of, is an input, size of our input. And n is obviously good as the dimension of the matrix. So this is a polynomial number of calls. We're going to compute the permanent mod r for all of these things. And then Chinese remainder theorem tells you if you have, if you know a number, which is the permanent, modulo all primes uh, whose product, well, if you know a number modulo a bunch of primes, then you can figure out the number modulo the product of those primes. And if we set the product to be bigger than the number could be, then w knowing it modulo that is actually knowing the number itself. Okay, so then we can reconstruct the permanent. So here we're really using multi-call. Cool. I think that's the first time I've used Chinese remainder theorem in a class that I've taught. Good stuff. Do you know why it's called the Chinese remainder theorem? I assume it was proved by a Chinese mathematician, but I anyone know the Sun history? Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, okay. I've heard of him. <laughs> Not the guy who did the art floor. Oh, okay, I don't know him then. <laughs> <laughs> Another Sun Tzu. <laughs> uh, cool, yeah, so. Permanent mod R is hard. Next claim is that the 0, 1 permanent mod R is hard. The whole reason we're going to mod R, well, I mean, it's interesting to know that computing permanent mod R is just as hard as permanent, but it's kind of a standard thing. Um, the reason I wanted to go to mod R was to get rid of these negative numbers. Negative numbers are annoying. Once I go to mod 
any r, num negative numbers flip around, and now I can think of everything as positive or not negative. Okay, now I can go back to gadget land. So suppose I have an edge of weight 5. This will work for any number greater than 1. If it's 1, I don't touch it. If it's greater than 1, I'm going <laughs> to make this thing. Uh, and the claim is um, there are exactly five ways to use this edge. Either you don't use it and you don't use it, but uh, if you do use it, there are exactly five ways to use it. If you make this traversal, there are five ways to do it. Remember, it has to be a cycle cover, so we have to visit everything. Uh, if you come up here, can't go that way, got to go straight. Can't go that way, got to go straight. Hmm, okay. <laughs> uh, so in fact, the rest of the cycle cover must be entirely within this picture. And so, for example, you can say that's a cycle, and then that's a cycle. These are loops. Uh, and then that's a cycle, 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 and whoops, I'm left with one vertex. So, in fact, I have to choose exactly one of the loops, put that in, and the rest can be covered. So, for example, if I choose this guy, then this will be a cycle, this will be a cycle, this will be a cycle, perfect parity, this will be a cycle, this will be a cycle, and this will be a cycle. Can't choose two loops. If I chose like these two loops, then this guy would be isolated. So you have to choose exactly one loop, and there are exactly five of them. And in general, you make there be k of them if, if you want weight k, and you can simulate. Uh, if you don't use this edge, then there's actually only one way to do it. You have to go all the way around like this. So that's cool. If you don't use the edge, it didn't mess with anything. If you use the edge, you get a weight of 5, multiplicative, because this is independent of all the other such choices. So you can simulate a high weight edge. Modulo R, um, or you can, in general, you can simulate a non-negative weight edge like this. Just These are all weight 1, obviously, and absent edges are 0. So we can convert in the modulo R setting. Um, there are no negative numbers, essentially. So we can just do that simulation. Everything will work mod R. So use gadget. Cool. Uh, now, finally, we can prove 0, 1 permanent is hard. Why? Because if we can compute the 0, 1 permanent, we can compute it mod R. <laughs> just compute the permanent, take the answer mod R, and you solve 0, 1 permanent mod R. So this is, this is what I might call a one-call reduction. It's not our usual notion of one-call reduction, because we're doing stuff at the end but I'm going to use one call in this setting. Just call it. In fact, we don't even have to change the input. But then when we get the output, we compute it mod R. Question? So in there, the weight, um, you can have really high weight, but then you're amplifying the number of nodes. So then when you use that, wouldn't then M? Oh, I see. If the weights were exponentially large, this would be bad news. Yeah. Uh, but they're not exponentially large because we know they're all at most 3. <laughs> they're between negative 1 and 3. Oh, uh, oh but negative 1, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Yes, OK, good. I need the prime number theorem. Thank you. So uh, we have numbers negative 1. Then we're mapping them modulo some prime. Now, negative 1 is actually the prime minus 1. Uh, so indeed, we do get weights that are as large as r. Um, so this is R here ha is sort of we're assuming is encoded in unary. Okay, it turns out we can afford to encode the primes in unary because the number of primes that we use is this polynomial thing, uh, weakly polynomial thing, and uh, by the prime number theorem, the prime with that index is roughly that big. It's a log factor larger. So the primes are going to, the, the actual value of the prime is going to be something like n log m times uh, log base e of n log m uh, by the prime number theorem. And that's, again, weakly polynomial. And so we can assume r is encoded in unary. <laughs> Good. Wow, we get to use the prime number theorem. That's fun. Is that the first time you had to use prime number? Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm pretty sure I've used prime number theorem if and only if I've used Chinese remainder theorem. Uh, they go hand in hand. Uh, right. Clear? So this was a kind of roundabout way, but we ended up getting rid of the negative numbers. Luckily, it still worked. And now 0, 1 permanent is hard. Therefore, counting the number of perfect matchings in a given bipartite graph is NP hard. These problems were equivalent, it's like they're identical. So you could, this was a reduction in one way, but it's equally reducible both ways. So you can reduce this one, or reduce this one to perfect matchings or vice versa. All right. Uh, here's some more fun things we can do. I can add to my list here, but uh, in particular we have 0, 1 permanent. Uh, so there are other ways you might be interested in counting matchings. So, so far we know it's hard to count perfect matchings. So uh, in a in a balanced bipartite graph, we had n vertices on the left and n vertices on the right. We're going to use that. Uh, then the hope is that there's matching of size n. But in general, you could just count, maybe those don't exist at all. Maybe you just want to count maximal matchings. These are not maximum matchings. Maximal, meaning you can't add any more edges to them. They're locally maximum. Uh, well, so that's going to be a bigger number. Uh, it's going to be always bigger than 0. Because the empty matching, well, you could start with the empty matching and add things. You'll get at least one maximal matching. Uh, but this is also sharp P complete. And you can prove it using some tricks from uh, bipartite uh, perfect matching counting. Uh, don't have a ton of time, so I'll go through this relatively quick. Uh, we're going to take each vertex and convert it, uh, basically make n copies of it. And when we have an edge, that's going to turn into a bi-clique between them. Why did I draw such a big one? OK. Uh, <laughs> uh, this was supposed to be n and n. OK, so just blow up every edge. My intent is to make matchings become more plentiful. Uh, so in general, if I used to have a matching of size i, I end up converting it into n factorial to the ith power distinct matchings of size n times i. OK, because what, if I use an edge here, now I get to put in an arbitrary perfect matching in this bi-clique, and there are n factorial of them. Cool. Why did I do that? Because now I suppose that I knew how to count the number of maximal matchings. So they're going to be matchings of various sizes. And from that, I want to extract the number of perfect matchings. Sounds impossible. But when you make things giant like this, they kind of, all the matchings kind of separate. It's like uh, biology or something, um, chemistry. So <laughs> let's see. <laughs> <laughs> it shows how much I know. Uh, number of maximal matchings is going to be sum i equals 0 to n over 2. That's the si possible sizes of the matchings, of the old matchings, I should say. Number of original maximal matchings in the input graph of size i times n factorial to the i. OK, this is just rewriting. I'm just this thing, but I'm summing over all i. So I have however many matchings I used to have of size i, but then I multiply them by n factorial to the i, because these are all independent. Uh, cool. And this thing, the original number of matchings, in the worst case, I mean, the largest it could be is when everything is a bi-clique. And then we have uh, n over 2 factorial uh, maximal matchings originally. Uh, 
and this is smaller than that. And therefore, uh, we can pull this apart as a number modulo n factorial. <laughs> and each digit is the number of maximal matchings of each size. And we look at the last digit, we get all the, uh, the number of maximal matchings of size n over 2, also known as the number of perfect matchings. Question? So that second max is maximal? Yes, this is maximal. Other questions? So again, a kind of number theory trick. Uh, by blowing up, well, but yeah, by making each of these get multiplied by a different huge number, we can pull them apart, separate them. And in logarithm, these numbers are not huge, so it is actually plausible you could compute this thing. And in a tree graph, you definitely could do it by various multiplications at each level. All right, uh, so that's nice. Let's do another one that flavor. So I was actually wondering, can you find all those primes in polynomial time? Uh, you could use uh, the sieve of Aristosthenes. Is that like, uh, gonna be we can handle pseudopoly here because, as we argued, the primes are not that big. So we could just spend, we could just do sieve, sieve of Aristosthenes. We can s afford to spend linear time in the largest prime, or quadratic in that even. You could do the naive algorithm. Yeah. Not, we're not doing real <laughs> algorithmic number theory here, uh, like crypto, where you have to be more careful. All right. So here's another question. What if I just want to count the number of matchings? No condition. This is going to use almost the reverse trick. So no maximal constraint, just all matchings, including the empty matching. Count them all. We'll see why in a moment this is quite natural. Uh, so I claim I can do a multi-call reduction to bipartite number of maximal matchings. And here are my calls. For every graph G, I'm going to make a graph G prime, uh, where if I have a vertex, I'm going to add k extra nodes connected just to that vertex. So these are leaves. And so if this vertex was unmatched over here, then I have k different ways to match it over here. Okay? And my intent is to measure this number of matchings of size n over 2 minus k. That would be the hope. Uh, but, well, okay. So if I have mr uh, matcha matchings of size r over here, these will get mapped to uh, mr times k plus 1 to the r uh, matchings of size, uh, who, no, not of size, matchings over here. Because uh, for each one, I could either leave it unmatched, or I could add this edge, or I could add this edge, or I could add this edge. And that's true for every unmatched vertex. So sorry, this is not size r. This is size n over 2 minus r. r is going to be the number of leftover guys. Then it kind of pops out over here. So I'm going to run this algorithm. I'm going to compute the number of matchings in gk for all k up to like n over 2 plus 1. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to do this, and what I end up computing is the number of matchings in each gk, which is going to be the sum over all r, r is 0 to n over 2, of mr, the original number of matchings of size uh, n over 2 minus r, times k plus 1 to the r. Now, this is a polynomial in k plus 1. And if I evaluate a polynomial uh, at its degree plus one different points, I can reconstruct the coefficients of the polynomial and therefore get all of these. And in particular, get m0, which is the number of uh, perfect matchings. Ta-da. <laughs> cool. 
Okay. Uh, having too much fun. Enough matchings. We have all these versions of SAT, which are hard. But in fact, uh, there are even funnier versions, like positive 2SAT. Positive 2SAT is really easy to decide, but it turns out if I add a sharp, <laughs> it is sharp -y complete. This is sort of like max 2SAT, but here you have to satisfy all the constraints, but you want to count how many different ways there are to solve it. Um, this is the same thing as vertex cover. Remember, vertex cover is the same as positive 2SAT. So also sharp vertex cover is hard, and therefore also sharp clique is hard. Uh, so it, this is actually a parsimonious reduction from bipartite matching. That's why I wanted to get there. So for every edge, we're going to make a variable x sub e, uh, which is true if the edge is not in the perfect matching. And so then whenever I have two incident edges, e and f, we're going to have a clause which is either I don't use e or I don't use f. That's two sat. Done. <laughs> satisfying, <laughs> it's parsimonious. So satisfying assignments will be one to one with uh, bipartite matchings. So this is why you should care. And if we instead reduce from, uh, did I erase it? Bipartite maximal matchings um, up here, then I get the, the counting the number of uh, maximal, maximally true assignments that satisfy the two-sat clause is also hard uh, for what it's worth. So a different way of, of counting that. Maximal means uh, you can't set any more variables true. Yeah? Since the edges in your positive two-sat uh, reduction are um, the, the variables there are true when the edge is miss is not in the matching. I think it's maximally false, not maximally true. Also, maximally true. You just said everything oh. to true. Yes. Right. 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 Sorry. I see. Right. So it's minimal solutions for two cent. Thank you. Um, okay. In fact, it's known that uh, three regular bipartite. Planar sharp vertex cover. Uh, I won't prove this one, but so in particular, you can make this planar, uh, although it doesn't look like we have positive here. And you can also make it bipartite, which doesn't mean a lot in two sat land, but it means makes a lot of sense in vertex cover land. Uh, in my zero remaining minutes, I want to mention one more concept. Um, to go back to the uh, sort of original question of uniqueness for puzzles. And you'll see this in the literature. If you look at it, uh, a lot of people won't even mention sharp P, but they'll mention ASP. ASP is a slightly weaker, but for most intents and purposes, essentially identical notion to sharp P in, from a hardness perspective. The goal for AS, uh, in general, if I have a problem, a search problem, like we started with, the ASP version of that search problem is uh, I give you a solution and I want to know is there another one. Okay, this is a little different from everything we've seen because uh, I actually give you a starting point. And there's some problems where this helps a lot. For example, if the solution is never unique, like uh, coloring, if I give you a K coloring, I can give you another one. I'll just swap <laughs> colors one and two. Or uh, more subtle, if I give you a Hamiltonian cycle in a three regular graph, there's always a way to switch it and make another one. Uh, so ASP is sometimes easy, but um, you basically use the same reductions. If you can find a parsimonious reduction that also has the property, so parsimonious reduction, there is a one-to-one -one bijection between solutions to x and solutions to x prime. If you can also compute that bijection, if you can convert a solution from one into the other, which we could do in every single proof we've seen and even the ones we haven't seen, you can always compute up that bijection between solutions of A to solutions of B. And so what that means is if, um, you know, if I can solve uh, B, well, so uh, let's consider the ASP version of A where I give you a solution. 
If I can convert that solution into a solution for my B problem, and then with the parsimonious reduction, I also get a B instance, then um, I can solve the ASP problem for B. That's a decision problem. Is there another solution? If yes, then A will also have another solution. Because it's parsimonious, uh, the numbers will be the same. We, don't, we need a weaker version of parsimony. We, don't, we just need that one and more than one are kept the same. If this one was unique, then this one should be unique. If this one wasn't unique, then this one should be not unique. If I can solve B, then I can solve A. Or if I can solve ASPB, then I can solve ASPA. A lot of these proofs are done, uh, so-called ASP reduction is uh, usually done by a parsimonious reduction. And so in particular, this was introduced, this concept was introduced in the likes of like Slitherlink, I think was one of the early ASP completeness proofs. Um, and they were interested in this because the idea is if you're designing a puzzle, usually you design a puzzle with a solution in mind, but then you need to make sure there's no other solution. So you have exactly this setup. Uh, and if you want a formal definition of ASP completeness, it's in the notes, but uh, it's not that uh, difficult. The key point here is if you're going to prove sharp P or ASP completeness, you might as well prove the other one as well. Get it. twice the results for basically the same reduction. All the versions of 3SAD and 1 and 3SAD and all those things, those were all parsimonious, and all of those are ASP complete as well. But once you get into Simonius, you're no longer preserving one versus more than one. Uh, so while you preserve, from a counting perspective and multi-call reductions where you can divide that off, that's fine. But from an ASP completeness perspective, you're not fine. So uh, in fact, all the stuff that we just did with the permanent matchings and two sharp two sat, they're sharp complete. They may not be ASP complete. Um, but you'll notice the puzzles that we reduced from, like, whatever, Shaka Shaka is one of them. That was from a version of 3SAT. And the, the other one we had was from a version of Hamiltonicity. The, this guy, these were all, which was also from 3SAT. So these are all ASP complete also. Yeah, but if you use the weirder things like 2SAT, you don't get that. So usually in one proof, you can get NP hardness, ASP hardness, and sharp P hardness. Uh, but if you're going to go from these weirder problems with simonious reductions, then you only get sharp P hardness because they're not even NP hard. Cool. All right. Thank you.